Hey everybody. Uh, so today is a really cool one. Uh, we're gonna make a belt, but it's the end of a 10 year test that I didn't know how long it was gonna go on for, but basically what I did was, when I moved to Cape Cod, I made myself a natural veg tan belt, and then I didn't do anything to it. And I wore it every single day. I wore it snowboarding, I wore it to my sister's wedding, it got, I accidentally went swimming in it in salt water a few times, and it's pretty much time for a new one. Uh, someone out there was very kind enough to send me a slice of J and FJ Baker, the super thick belt hide. So it's going to be like dream belt city over here. And we're going to use some of buckle guys new. Okay. So I have, this is the new vlogging camera that I'm shooting with for now. So I think I have to be one of those people that does this, but buckle guy just released. Hopefully that's focusing cause I can't see the screen. Um, this is Buckle Guy's new in-house line of tools that I'm not designing, right? So they we helped with like the handle design and everything like that. But um, this is not just some stock throw your logo on it, um, you know, type situation. Custom ferrules, custom handles, super nice hardwood. It's kind of a blend between like if Weaver and Palo Santo had like a middle child, it would be this. But the pricing is more towards like the weaver end and the quality is super nice. So we're going to make a belt. We're going to use some French skivers. We're going to use some edgers that I'm really not good with, but I will try to get better at. And then, I mean, look at all these things. They have hardwood burnishers, slickers. This is like a burnisher and um, a slicker all in one. And then it's also, you can use it as a bone folder. They have your traditional slicker. Um, I just got this box in the mail and it's cool to finally see it all come to fruition because they've genuinely be work, been working on this for like a year. So we're gonna use these tools for the first time. I've never touched these before in a workshop setting. Um, I might do some creasing. There's a creaser here. I have an adjustable creaser here. Um, they, made, they ran the gamut on all the tool selection that they made. Um, but I generally don't really care for creasing because it's a belt and the creasing falls out. And I just want a plain belt. So we're going to look at my 10 year old belt first and see what 14 ounce veg tan turns into after 10 years of wearing it every single day without doing it. This has never touched oil. It's, I've never oiled it, suntanned it, uh, waxed it. I've never done anything to it. And you'll see it's falling apart, which so this, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. I just wanted to see what would happen. Watch this. Huh? Maybe I can make it go brighter. I put LED strips in. LEDs in the sign. Move some plants around. So now like you can kind of see. Let's see. So here's the stitches and the stitching chisel packaging. And you can see I collect all sorts of old graphic stuff. So that's generally where I get all my ideas from. So this is the belt that I made. 10 years ago and you can see it's totally dried out in some places it's cracking it's got tons of paint on it it's got, and this was natural veg tan so this was roughly this color to start uh, this is thoroughbred natural veg which is <coughs> North American hides tanned in Mexico thoroughbreds a, a tannery that was once owned by an American company, I think they're still owned by an American company, but they moved down to Mexico when the APA cracked down on environmental stuff. Anyway, they make really nice leather. And we made our belts out of them, their hides, until we stopped making belts. But as you can see, uh, I've gained and lost <laughs> lots of weight in this belt over 10 years. Um, and we're ready for a new one. But if you look at the back, the whole back is basically fully burnished, which is really cool. It's almost like you tokenalled it. Let me get some B-roll for you and I'll put it in here. And um, so I want to make a very similar belt to this. Let me roll this up. We have some special leather to use that I was sent by a very kind leather worker who heard I was going to be making a belt that I was going to be using for probably the next 10 years. 
and then uh, we're going to use that leather, all the new buckle guy tools, and make a belt real quick. And I'll show you how quick it is to make a belt. So Carmine Jack, whom I've never really spoken to but I follow to on Instagram, sent me a box. And in this box is one strip of leather. And I know what you're thinking, Eric, you have tons of leather. It's true, but beautiful card. Thank you guys so much. This is J and F J Baker's natural oak bark bridle, which is nearly impossible to get in the States. Um, I remember I bought two hides once. The only distributor was like an old lady in Arizona and it took like six months. So they sent me this gorgeous natural oak bark tanned hide that is big enough. I'm like a 44 inch waist. I'm a big boy um, for me to make a belt out of. So this is what we're going to be using. And this is what I am going to boil and hopefully get, you know, the proper 20, 25 years out of it. Um, I'm not going to stitch it. I'm not going to do anything. It's just going to be a simple belt. That's how I like my belts. But I'm going to show you how I just make a slipping belt, size it, boil it, put it on. All right, we'll make sure we're, cal we're calibrated there. 13 ounces. So we're going to have to thin down the part where the buckle goes. And for that, we're going to use some French edgers, because that's the safest way to do it, for me at least. I'm not interested in hand skiving oak bark tan leather. Okay, so this is my template. It's made out of leather. And on this side, it serves to show me where to skive. Now, if you have a pull skiver, go for it. Um, the secret to making belts is to have the tannery just cut them into strips and punch these holes for you. They'll easily have a die for it. So for the last 10 years when we were selling belts, we would just receive the belts cut down with the holes punched in them. Um, so this is where we decided to skive to. Now I'm going to make marks on both sides of this hide. The first I'm going to make in pencil on the front, and that's where we're going to be where my Chicago screws, my slot punch, and my other Chicago screws go. Now I'm probably going to have to make this slot punch a little bit longer. Um, because this leather, even when it's skived down, is a little tough. Um, then that I want to make sure that the buckle lays right. Now on the back, this is where I have my guide for where to skive from. I'm going to take a sharpie here. So I normally would do this in pencil, but I want it to show up on camera. So I want to skive about to there all the way. Obviously you want to thin this out. This is about 13 ounces. We want this about 10, possibly nine. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this around. Now I know that the last hole, and we're going to sky this away so it's okay that I'm drawing on it. The last hole that's not centered, but is going to be roughly there. So I'm going to take my template, line that up, and draw a curved line here so that when this ultimately is done, the skived part will notch right into that other skived part. And you can see, like, there's no way you're bending this. We gotta take a bunch of material out. Okay, so we have eight, 10, and 12 on Buckle Guy's new French skivers. I'm not, I keep saying I'm not like super into tools. I'm not like a tool guy. But these are just so gorgeous with the font that they picked. Just that simple B for buckle guy right on the ferrule. So let's uh, let's see how these babies work on some of the toughest leather in the world. Um, I'm going to start from the top. I'm going to use a 10. These are unsharpened, straight out of the box. Oh, 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 oh that was a good sound. These things are sharp. Oh. So I'm gonna follow my curved line. Now you gotta be real careful with these on edges because I could easily see accidentally skiving an edge down to like two ounces when you didn't mean to. So get in and out of the edges. This is the 10. Let's go 
up to the 12 and see how much, if we get anything different. No, we're getting the same. Usually, for me at least, the wider the, the wider the skyver, the harder it is to control on small pieces like this. Um, I think I do prefer the 10 on this belt leather, but you can see it just took off. It's almost like using a hand plane. Um, it just kind of evens everything out. I'm sure the eight's gonna be like, here, I'll try to do this. This is gonna be the detail. And they make them in smaller sizes too, but we can just go in there and take that corner right off. So we have where we're gonna put our buckle down to roughly about nine ounces, eight, nine ounces. We did that with the French Skyvers. But I'm gonna use my sanding machine and I'm gonna go through and I'm not good enough with a French Skyver to get everything perfect. So there's no shame in just kind of passing it through the sander, getting the high spots, getting the low spots. Just smoothing everything out just to get a nice finish. And as you can see, this is a very, very um, not sandy piece of sandpaper. Uh, these pieces, these drum sandpapers from Weaver come like extremely aggressive. So the first thing I do when I get one is I take a piece of metal and I kind of knock it down so it's a grit that I can work with. And I'm paying close attention to the edge here so that when it tucks in here, it's kind of a nice fade without losing too much strength. So you, I'm going by the bend here. We're gonna use, not Veladon, but something similar. Um, so I'm not worried about strength so much. Um, I just want it to have enough space for our buckle without being too thick that it kind of causes a bulge or too thin that it's gonna stretch out over time. Um, and I also want it kind of smooth. Like these little divots are areas where I went deeper. I'm not gonna sand down until the whole thing looks like that because it's just closed. Um, I just wanna make sure that I get it roughly the same thickness in this area. Okay, so now my back is sanded. I went through and punched all of my, my two Chicago screw holes and my slot punch. Now this is an inch and a half slot punch. You can go down a little bit in size if you're using thinner leather, but I find with thicker leather, it's nicer to go to air on a larger side size. You can see there's a little bit of space where the buckle is, and that will give the buckle a little bit of movement, but it'll also make it just lay really nice once it breaks in, and we can see that the rivet holes line up. So before, we go and make our keeper, which they so kindly sent me a piece already split down to make a keeper. Um, we're going to use, Buckle Guy has a version of Veladon now. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to apply that to the back of this to prevent any stretching, but I'm gonna end it here. I wanna catch these two rivets, and I wanna catch these two rivets, and then I'll just re-slot punch this so that it just goes the whole way. And that will prevent any stretching because what this is, is a fiber-based backing that adds no thickness, but it adds a lot of rigidity. So it's basically like adding a piece of mesh, basically. So you're not gonna get any stretching here, given that this belt is not gonna be stitched. Now this belt is an inch and a half wide. I've cut, they have a name for it, I'll look it up. Um, but I've cut this stuff to an inch and a quarter wide so that it's just hidden inside of the belt. Like that. That's probably too much. 
There we go. It doesn't have to be pretty. We're just trying to make sure we catch the rivets. The Chicago screws, I mean. Then we'll press that down. And now we know that none of this is gonna stretch. Believe it or not, the keeper, oh, the keeper's kind of the most complicated part of this whole belt build. But what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna use belt staples, but I'm also gonna use glue and an overlap joint. So I'm gonna take both of my pieces here. Actually, no, that's a lie. I'm gonna take both of my pieces here because I thinned this one out. And I like a little bit of extra room on my keeper but you can do this however you like. I want an overlap of about an inch to an inch and a quarter. So I'm gonna make one mark there, one mark there, and then one mark in there. Hopefully I got it. Um, and if I didn't, we'll redo it. You can just do it on the outside. So, What these marks are going to tell us is that this is ultimately the outside of the keeper, right? This mark is going to be an overlap. So we want to skive this down from the grain side, not the flesh side. And we want to get a nice wedge. Now this is all going to be hidden in the belt, so it's your first time making a belt, don't stress out too much about it. But you see now, we'll have that nice overlay, and we can put our belt staples right in there. Now the thing is, we need to take our line and transfer it right here, because on this side, we have to skive from the inside out. I think this is ready for a sharpening. Let's switch to... Oh no, it was the number 12. We're gonna switch to the number 10. There we go. Not that the number 12's more dull, it's just really big for a little piece like this, which is why it was giving me issues. You see how they maintain the thickness? Th this thickness is maintained here. So I'm gonna burnish this and then I'll show you the belt stapler. All right, so I have my keeper here. I applied glue to that side and I applied glue to that side. Now you can go as crazy as you want with keepers. You don't have to go this wild with it, but I like a nice sturdy keeper. So I'm going to line up my keeper on the outside with where I skived then I'm going to smush it down on the inside like this. Now, if you wanted to leave your keeper like that and hammer it down, I suppose you could. You could sew across there. You don't even need to glue it. You can just put two pieces together and put belt staples in, which is what we usually do. But this is my own personal belt, and it's a very special leather, so I'm going to show you what I'm going to do next. First thing we do is we take our belt staple. I have really big hands, so this is always gives me a problem. We put it in there. This shouldn't be wiggling around, but we'll make it work. Then we're gonna take, we can slide our belt keeper under here if it's thin enough, which it is. And then I'm gonna use the foot press to set the staple. Now I have plenty of room, so I'm gonna add a second one. So we'll put this in here, and we'll go on the other side. Ooh, this is gonna be a nice belt keeper. And then try to line it up. You're never gonna see it, but might as well make it nice. And there we go. So we have two staples. They come around on the inside, and between the glue, the overlap, and the staples, this is a belt keeper that you could damn near put Wait on. <laughs> We're going to give Buckle Guy's new number two edge beveler a try. I am notoriously horrible 
with any edge beveler that is not the weaver one that like is basically a safety beveler and prevents you from being able to dig into the leather. But I think number two should be big enough to get these hard edges off. And this leather is so tough that you could basically give your paper, yourself a paper cut on it. These are so sharp. Yeah, this is, this is working for me. Now I'm gonna do all four sides and then I'm gonna sand it with 400 grit. You could use a much bigger beveler if you wanted to do like a super round edge, but I, don't. I like a nice square edge. Okay, so here's what I've got. Just a simple water burnish, which is basically just burnishing. I sanded to 400 and then burnishing using water instead of gum trag or tokenol or anything like that. <clears throat> With a hide like this, there are so many oils and tallow stuffed in it that all you're really looking for, as far as I'm concerned, with the natural, is to bring out more of that natural trait in the edges. And when you burnish, all you're really doing is applying heat to bring those oils out. So it's it'll it'll mellow out and even out as it dries. It is damp still, but we are actually going to put the belt together now. So I am going to change one thing. Um, I'm going to use pop rivets instead of regular solid rivets, um, and that's because and I do have matching brass, brass rivets here I could use, but I figure why not try out, there's always a battle in the comment section about how long these last, whether they should be used on bags, yada yada. So let's put them on the belt and we'll see how long they last. This has been our sizing belt for the past probably seven or eight years. But when we do shows and someone wants a custom belt, it's better to have a belt on hand made out of the leather that you're using. Instead of saying, what's your pant size? Just have them put this on through their, boot, their belt loops and whatever it lands on is the size they are. Because I guarantee you, uh, with vanity sizing, you know, they size size 36 pants to 32 these days. People think they're size 32, but really they're 38. So this is our sizing belt. I'm gonna go use it and then punch myself some sizing holes in my belt. So this is a little bit more special than I thought it would feel. I have my own brand new belt out of one of the most fabulous leathers in the world, historically. Um, I absolutely love the little rivet detail. It's something anyone can do at home if you have the two rivet setters. And it just really looks really it just adds a little interest to, ironically, a spot you won't see, but that's okay. Um, I stuck with just the water burnish, and we'll try to roll this up to give you an idea. Now, I am going to condition this before I wear it, just to protect it from... I want it to wear evenly and be a little bit nicer, because I plan to have this one for longer than 10 years. Um, will a belt last you a lifetime? It depends on... Well, I guess it depends on how old you are, first of all. But secondly, it depends on what you mean by lifetime. Will a belt like this look nice enough to wear to a wedding 10 years after you buy it and wear it to work every day? Well, that's how, up to how you condition it, how you take care of it. Meaning, if you condition it right away, it's less prone to getting paint on it, or if you saddle soap it and condition it on the regular absolutely i think i think lifetime if you're in your 20s is asking a bit much i mean i don't think there's a lot of 60 year old belts that were worn every single day that are still being worn now um, however with a leather like this that is very possible because your grain structure is so tight that you can see i mean i don't know if you can see but the shine that i got just from 400 grit and water on the edges means it is stuffed full of oils and it's very um, dense. So I would say this could be the belt of a lifetime should you be in your mid 40s and not be a lumberjack. 
Um, what happens when you don't do anything to a belt for 10 years? This. Now, this leather is nowhere near that leather. This is just a thoroughbred hide, right? But we used to sell these belts for $40, $55, I think. And so for $5.50 a year, and, rea and the reality is, if I would have put a drop of conditioner on this, this belt would be still totally fine to use. But the test was what happens, like how long, what I wanted to know so that I could be more informed for the for my customers at the time or, you know, be able to say something to, to have input experience-wise. Uh, the crazy thing to me is that these started out the exact same color. So this is color change. Now, this was dunked in water a ton of times, which will affect the color too. But um, this is what you can expect your 10-year-old veg tan belt to look like. Um, I also use this, like I, built, I flip houses and stuff, so this gets very sweaty. It gets, obviously you can see the pink color on it, but it's still got, it's almost like with wine you have secondary notes when it starts to age and tertiary notes when it starts to sort of fall off. Um, it's almost like these are the tertiary colors before everything goes this deep brown black situation where it can't get any darker. Um, so yeah, that's what happens when you wear a belt for 10 years without conditioning it at all. And this is my new belt. I want to thank Carmine Jack for sending me out a strip. I want to thank Melissa from Dad Hands for, even, for mentioning and getting that going. And I want to thank Buckle Guy for providing me a piece of hardware that I am not even replacing, but carrying on 10 years later. Um, because they're just that well made. And I've never cleaned this either. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.